Acts chapter 8. As we look at Acts chapter 8, we've been following the church and how they have uh, embarked upon this calling that God had given them. God gave them this calling uh, when Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 8, 1 verse 8, he said, "Uh, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That is the calling of this church. That is the calling of this church. We are called by God. The supreme calling, the the priority is we glorify God by telling others who Jesus is. And the church embarked upon that great journey, Acts chapter 2. We see that the Spirit of God fell at Pentecost. Today's Pentecost Sunday, by the way. Uh, The Spirit of God fell at Pentecost, and 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus Christ and were baptized. We see in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, another four or 5,000 people come to faith in Christ and are baptized. We see the church gathered together at, in Acts chapter 4, praying together and, and uh, committed to one another in a very special way. We see in Acts chapter 5 that there are obstacles and division that happens in Acts chapter 6, but God overwhelms those obstacles and gives clarity through the division so that we, the church, might step up and serve. The church being the family, each one of us seeing our role and our responsibility to help fulfill the calling. The calling is to tell others about Jesus. Wednesday night, we looked at Acts chapter 6, beginning of verse 8, all the way to chapter 7, verse 60, and we saw the, 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 the deacon, Stephen, stand up and fulfill the calling. He told uh, the, the Hellenistic Jewish people there who Jesus was, and as he told them who Jesus was, they got very upset, and they killed Stephen. And now in Acts chapter 8, we hear the record of the first church undergoing persecution led by a guy named Saul who would later become Paul and will meet him again in Acts chapter 9. And Saul is breathing threats against the church. And the church scattered. In Acts chapter 8 verse 4, it says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the good news, sharing the gospel, declaring who Jesus was to everyone they encountered. They went everywhere. They were scattered everywhere, just like you are. When you leave this place, we've got people that will uh, scatter to all the seven cities of Hampton Roads who gather with us each week. And, And you'll scatter. And the beauty of that scattering is that God purposes the scattering for us, the church, to fulfill our calling. And we share the gospel wherever we go because everywhere we go there are people who need the gospel have you ever been to a junkyard i don't know why they call it a junkyard i think it's more rightly called the place where once valuable items have gone to die now you go to a junkyard you'll see cars there those cars were valuable to somebody at some point in time you'll see refrigerators that once had great value and then somehow lost the, their value or, or washing machines or dishwashers. Uh, you'll see bicycles that are rusting in the sun uh, and all of these once valuable items sitting under the, the sun and the moon and the stars and the rain and the heat and the cold and the heat. They're, they're, they're sitting there and they're rusting away. These things that once had value now are left on the scrap heap. And the truth is, everywhere we go, we encounter people who have an intrinsic, intrinsic value. They have a value because they're made in the image of God. Everybody. Every person made in the image of God, and every person who is breathing is made in the image of God. Every person has intrinsic value. They have a value stamped on them by God's image. And yet, they live their lives as though... They're in a junkyard. They've lost that sense of value. They they don't see their value to God, and they can't experience the value themselves. And they're looking, and they're searching, and they're longing for something to return them to that value. This is not a self-worth or a self-help sermon. This is the gospel. You see, sin 
has separated us from God. Our sin, your sin, my sin, it separated me from God so that I was like that car in the scrap heap. Intrinsically valuable because I'm made in God's image and yet distanced from that value because I'm distanced from God. And there's nothing we can do to return to God. There's nothing that we can do in our own effort to get to God so that we are sitting through life. The ups and downs, the twists and the turns, the have of life and the have not of life, and, and we're just rusting in the sun and shivering in the cold. We're, we're drowning in the rain, and we're thirsting in the heat. We long to know value again, but we can't because our sin has separated us from God. And every human being that we encounter, every human being in this place has tasted the emptiness, the longing, the longing of the people that we encounter here in Acts chapter 8. You see, everybody is searching uh, for rescue, is searching to be made whole. Everyone is longing to fix what's broken inside them, and many of us try to fix it ourselves. Everyone wants to be part of a family. Everybody wants to belong. And yet, each one of those ingredients that make a whole life are missing because our sin has separated us from the giver of a whole life. And so God sends the church on mission to fulfill our calling to share Jesus with others because everywhere we go, we encounter people who were just like we were. The people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people in your family. They're living out their lives in quiet desperation, sometimes loud desperation. They long for a wholeness that's out of their reach. They long for a fix that they can't find themselves. They long for a family, for belonging, and they can't get it. That's every person we encounter. No matter how vigilant they are or how hostile they are toward Christ, their deepest need is Christ. So the church fulfills her calling when we share the gospel wherever we go. When you share the gospel wherever you go. The person that we're going to look at today is a guy named Philip. Philip is one of the seven that we looked at last week who stepped up to serve in Acts chapter 6. He, he stepped up to serve the family. And that's what we're called to do. We're, we're called to step up and serve the family. The scripture says, beginning in verse 5, it says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to the people in that city. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. We find Philip, and he goes to people who were searching for wholeness in life. He goes to people who were searching for restoration. He went to the Samaritan city. Now, what's important, a couple of things. First, this is fulfillment of Acts 1.8. Remember what Acts 1.8 said? Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses for me in Jerusalem. That's taken care of. In Judea, that's taken care of. In Samaria, so here we see the family of faith fulfilling her calling by going to Samaria in the person of Philip. Now, Philip goes to the Samaritans, and so it's important because it's fulfillment of the call. It's also important to understand who the Samaritans were. 
The Samaritans were a, an offshoot of Judaism. They uh, had some semblance of Judaism, but they weren't part of that crew. They had different kinds of beliefs, and one central theology that Samaritans had, the people in this city had, was they were longing for the restorer to come. They were looking for that leader, that ruler, who would come and restore them. They were looking for restoration. They were looking to be made whole. And so Philip comes, and he begins to preach Jesus to them, preach the Messiah. Here's the one who can fix what's broken inside of you, and maybe that's where you are today, and people longing to be made whole, people looking to be restored. This past week, I saw a, a video clip of one of the pop stars who's saying that she's going to find wholeness in life by her gender fluidity. Uh, listen, that's where people are. They're on a mad search to be made whole. And they're going to try anything they can to fix that hole in their soul. They're looking to be made whole, and this person is looking for wholeness through gender fluidity. Can I tell you something? That won't work for them or for anyone. But here's the good news. Philip went to those who were looking for uh, someone to fill the hole in their soul, someone to restore them. He preached Christ to them, and they believed, and they were saved, and they were transformed by God's grace. Those who were looking to be restored found the answer in Jesus Christ. And guys, listen. It's our job not to ridicule the pop star or the person who is looking for wholeness, but to empathize and sympathize with them and provide for them the one true answer. Stop making it about politics. Start making it about the gospel. We need to tell people about Jesus because Jesus is the only answer for a person who's empty and needs to be made whole. Have you shared Jesus with someone? Philip went to the people of Samaria, and he said, listen, you're looking for a restorer. His name is Jesus. Amen. You come here today, and you're looking for a restorer. His name is Jesus, and he can take your life, and he can fill it with satisfaction when you come to him by faith. Philip went to the Samaritans, and in the city of Samaria, there was a guy named Simon, and he was a magician. I want you to hear about Simon uh, just for a second. Simon was a guy who uh, saw, uh, thought that he was some great big deal. It says in verse 9, he says, there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city. And he astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, and from the least to the greatest, they said, this man is the great power of God. There are people like Simon who long to fix what's broken in them by having positions of prestige or popularity or power. You see it in politicians who want a great name for themselves. You see it in commercials. There's a new commercial out by Nair. It says, worship yourself and others will follow. Literally says that. Worship yourself, and others will follow. They're trying to fix what's broken in them. And Simon was trying to fix what was broken in him. And he tried magic, and magic uh, made a great name for him. But then Philip comes along, and he does all these miracles, and people begin to be more astonished at Philip than they were at Simon. And so Simon says, well, I'm going to attach myself to Philip. And, and so it says there that he believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere he went. Then comes along Peter, and 
and, and the apostles, and they come down to Samaria to see what God was doing and to support Philip in the mission. And, and, and uh, uh, Peter and the apostles laid hands on those who believed on Jesus, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and Simon the magician was amazed at this, so much so that he turned to Simon Peter, and he said, Peter, give me what you've got. I'll give you money for it. And Peter said, to hell with you and your money. That's what he said. I'm not cussing. I'm telling you what the Bible says. <laughs> Peter said, you have a crooked heart. It's not right with God. He said, inside of you, there's something broken. You're imprisoned by bitterness and in the cell of sin. And then Peter said, you need to pray that perhaps you need to repent and perhaps God's forgiveness will come upon you. See, the story of Simon is one that uh, tells us and teaches us that there are people who will go to any lengths to fix what's broken inside them. They'll pay for it. They'll hurt other people for it. They'll go to any lengths to make themselves feel big, even if it makes other people feel small. They'll do all these things, and you know these people. Some of us are those people. And they certainly can frustrate you, and they can upset you, but really, the problem with people who are broken and need to be fixed is that they can't fix themselves. Do you realize that no matter what you try to make yourself feel better, it will not work apart from Jesus Christ? No matter what you try, whatever pill you choose, it will end up being poison for you. Unless it's Jesus Christ who died for your sin and rose again from the dead. When we encounter people who are uh, bloviating so greatly about how great they are, don't get in an argument with them. Talk to them about Jesus. Let them see that the only hope that they have for a restored whole soul, the only hope that they have for a brokenness to be made whole, is through faith in Jesus Christ. Repent and believe on him. We go to people who are uh, searching to be made whole. We go to people who are trying to fix themselves. And finally, we go to people who are longing to belong. Now, that's the story of the Ethiopian at the end of Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we hear the story of this uh, of Philip being sent to an Ethiopian down in the middle of the desert. And, and, uh, and this begins in verse 26, and it goes all the way to the end of, of chapter 8 through verse 40. The story of the Ethiopian, and just kind of give you some background here, the Ethiopian had gone up to Jerusalem to worship. But here's the problem. Not only was he a Gentile, he was a Gentile that was a eunuch, and that meant he could not worship with the Jewish people. He was barred from the temple. And yet he still longed to be part of God's family. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship and, and, and he became so hungry for God that on his trip home to Cush, to Ethiopia, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. How many of y'all do that? He was reading Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit of God got to work, and he sent Philip on a mission down in the middle of the wilderness to encounter this Ethiopian. And when Philip caught up to the Ethiopian's chariot, he, he said, what are you reading? And he said, I'm reading this stuff, but I don't understand. And he said, how can I understand unless somebody guide me? And Philip said, I'm the guy for you. And Philip jumped up in the chariot, and he began to tell the Ethiopian about Jesus about Jesus who came to take those who are far from God and longing for family, longing to belong to God's family. 
And Jesus, who paid the price for our sin to tear down the separation between us and God. Jesus, who is the suffering servant who took the stripes and the whips and the, and, the, and the beating for us so that we, through faith in him, might be made whole. And the Ethiopian heard about Jesus, and he found family for the very first time, the family of God. The one who was longing to belong is now part of God's family. Now, listen, you're here today, and no matter how much of an outsider you may feel like you are through faith in Jesus you can belong through faith in Jesus you can be part of God's family you can find nourishment for your soul in the family of God no longer a stranger to the promises of God but now a participant in those promises you can live a life that is full and complete in the family that God has made for you. No longer are you sitting on the scrap heap of life. Now, now you've returned to a masterpiece of God's great creation. The Scripture says that the Ethiopian believed on Jesus the Christ, and he was saved, and he was baptized. So what does that mean for us today? Quick journey through Acts chapter 8, but as we look at this journey, I want you to hear clearly what this journey through Acts 8 means to us, the family of faith called First Norfolk. Okay? So here are the bullet point application. Here's what we need to do in light of what God's Word says to us today. First, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, share the gospel with somebody. Do you believe that Jesus can change a life? Thomas Watson, Puritan from the 17th century preacher dude, he said that monuments of God's mercy are trumpets of his praise. Do you know what that means? It means if you've been rescued by God's grace, your calling is to be a trumpet of God's praise, found through faith in Jesus Christ. Are you telling people about Jesus? Would you be willing today to identify one person among your peer group, one person in your family, one person that you see on the street, one person that you encounter every day at your work or at school or in your neighborhood? Would you be willing to identify that one person and say, that's the person Like Philip, I'm going to fulfill the calling of my family of faith, and I'm going to share the gospel with them. I'm going to tell them who Jesus is. Guys, this isn't optional for us as a family. It is the mandate from God. And all of us have someone in our life. Everywhere we go, there are people who are broken. There are people who are trying to fix their life themselves. There are people who are looking to belong. And everywhere we go, the answer to their every need is Jesus. Why in the world would we keep silent about it? Would you commit today to help our family of faith fulfill the calling that God has given to us and share the gospel with that one person in your sphere of influence? If you can't identify one person, would you be willing to pray with me every single day? This is my prayer. God, lead me to someone today with whom I can share Jesus. Would you be willing to pray that? Would you have the courage as part of this family of faith to join us in this family prayer? God! Will you lead me to someone today with whom I can share Jesus? We need to be like Philip. Second, if you're a follower of Jesus and you have not yet been baptized, then be baptized. We need to be like the Ethiopian eunuch. That Ethiopian came to the water's edge. He had heard the gospel. And uh, down in verse 36 and 37, it says, now as they 
uh, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the Ethiopian said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And the Ethiopian answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he got off the chariot, and he and Philip got in the water, and the Ethiopian was baptized. Baptism is a declaration of our commitment to Christ. And baptism follows faith. Now, to be baptized prior to faith is kind of like uh, it, 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 it's it's kind of like eating dog food for breakfast. You might get something out of it, but it's not what you're looking for. Being baptized prior to faith is not something that we see in Scripture. Baptism follows faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are here today and you're a follower of Christ, but you haven't been baptized as a believer, then be baptized today. Some of you are here and that's exactly what you need to do. You, you, uh, like Brad did last week, you, you, need to, you need to say, I'm a believer. Yes, I have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. But I need to stand up and declare, I belong to God's family through baptism. If you've believed on Jesus and you haven't yet been baptized as a believer, be baptized. We need to be like Philip. We need to be like the Ethiopian. And third, we need to be like the Samaritans and Simon and the Ethiopians. If you've not yet believed on Jesus, then come to him today. Can I tell you, every time we gather, I know that there are people here who are far from God. You have yet to find wholeness of life that you're searching for. You look, you're looking for a restorer in all the wrong places, and, and Jesus comes to you and he says, come to me and I'll make you whole. And then people gathered with us in this room today, and you're like Simon trying to fix what's wrong with you yourself. And whatever pill that is, it becomes poison to your soul. And Jesus comes to you and says, come to me, and I'll fix what's broken. We're like the Ethiopian, longing to be a part of God's family. And no amount of religious exercise is going to make that happen. There's no amount of moral codes that we follow that can fix the distance between us and God. But Jesus comes to us and he says, I died for your sin on a cross so that you might be forgiven forever. And I rose from the dead so that you might have a new life. I built a bridge between you and God. Will you come to me today? Friends, if you're here today and you're leaning on something other than Jesus to give you life, I invite you to repent of all those things, to turn away from all those things, and to put your trust in Jesus alone. To turn away from all those things that you've been leaning on to give you hope and purpose and meaning and satisfaction and belonging and wholeness in life. Turn away from all those other things and turn to Jesus. Say, I trust in you. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he alone can bring me to the Father. If you have not yet believed on Jesus, I invite you today to come to him by faith. 
Would everyone please bow your heads, close your eyes. In these next few moments, I believe that the Spirit of God is going to work great things in your heart and in your life. There are some here today, and you're a follower of Jesus, and God has placed upon your heart the name of that somebody that you need to share with this week. I invite you to come to this altar and pray for that person, to come to this altar and pray for yourself that God would give you the strength and the courage to tell them about Jesus who has changed your life. Some of you are here today and you're followers of Jesus, but you have yet to be baptized as a believer. This isn't a religious exercise, by the way. Baptism isn't some religious ritual that we try to fulfill. Baptism is an act of obedience to God. It's a, it's, it's, it's a willful determination that I will identify with Jesus and the family of faith. You're here today and you're... You've believed on Jesus, but you haven't been baptized. I invite you today to commit to be baptized. I invite you today to come here, and I'll be here at the front. If you need to be baptized, you come and you talk to me, and I'll help you take the next step of obedience. Some of you are here today in person and online. And you need to come to Christ by faith. You need your life changed by Him. You need wholeness for what's broken. You need life instead of death. You need hope instead of despair. You need Jesus. And right now the Spirit of God is working in your heart and He is compelling you to come to Christ. Like the Ethiopian, you need help understanding how to do that and and I want to I wanna be that help to you. If you're here today and you long to embrace Jesus, to come to Christ, to have your life made whole through faith in Him, in a few moments after I pray, I invite you to come and talk to me here at the front. If you're online, I invite you to text Jesus to the number on the screen or email pastor at firstnorfolk.org and just say, I need to come to Christ. Or I need to be baptized. Church family, in these next few moments, eternity hangs in the balance for some. Will you pray? This altar is going to be open for you to pray for those ones that he's planted on your heart. And pray for yourself. Oh God, give me the courage to be a witness for you. I'll be waiting for anyone who wants to be baptized or come to Christ. Now, Father, this is your moment. You're having conversation with people all around this room by your Holy Spirit. Now I pray that we would be obedient to you in these moments. Give courage and faith that is needed to respond in obedience to you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.